Most of us don't show the world who we really are, and it can tear us apart from ourselves and from each other. My last five years is a pretty good example. Back then, I didn't know what I believed in. My life lacked purpose, and I was depressed. And I think you can see it in my eyes. I had a loving family, a nice house by a beach, and a close community, so what was wrong? Well, I felt like my mind was surrounded by a grey fog, a recurring feeling of worthlessness and aimlessness, and I lost hope that it would ever change. Like a fog, there was nothing I could put my finger on, but also no way to see through it. And like a fog, it came and went. On a bad day, I was lucky if I could do one productive thing, like make a phone call or send an email. But if you asked me how I was, I'd say, oh yeah, I'm fine, thanks. The last thing I wanted was to admit that I wasn't doing so well. I worked as a self-employed IT consultant, and my clients really liked having a computer guy they could actually understand. But if I made a mistake or got stuck on something, I'd be savagely self-critical. And I'd tell myself, you've got no idea what you're doing. Anyone else would have fixed this by now. You can't possibly charge for this. So I'd clam up and beat myself up, and that fog would swirl around me. Whatever my day was like, though, I enjoyed cooking and eating. Um, strong coffee was my reason to get out of bed, and then sometimes I'd get distracted checking stuff online before I got onto things. I'd grab sweet snacks and energy drinks in the afternoon to pick me up, and then by the end of the day, often I'd feel guilty that I hadn't done what I should have done. Um, but cooking was where I took the pressure off myself, and it was always much more fun with two or three beers, or my favourite drink of all, strong rum and coke. So I'd get carried away, eat too much food, finish all the leftovers, and then still scoff a sweet treat. I'd fall asleep on the couch and then drag myself to bed, but keep on sort of jolting awake just as I was trying to drift off. I had coffee to get going, food for comfort, and alcohol to wind down. Sleep badly and do it all again tomorrow, just a bit fatter and sadder. None of this was good for my family, though. I felt bad for feeling bad and stuck where I was. But something needed to change, and food opened the door. One day, looking out the window of a plane at the clouds below, an idea came to me. Maybe I could make sourdough bread for the locals. I'd always loved playing the dough when I made pizza, and this was a way I could do that from home. And it was a really important step for me, because it was taking charge of finding satisfaction in my work. So I made my own sourdough starter, and I felt a real affinity with it. As it bubbled and grew, we both started coming to life. I began learning the secrets of great bread, and I spent a hot, earthy summer building a huge, wood-fired brick oven. And I found real satisfaction pulling those loaves of dark, crusty sourdough out of the oven. So imagine this, you're standing there next to me, and the sourdough is crackling while it cools, while the surf is roaring in the distance. And while we chat, we break off steaming chunks of bread and eat them slathered with butter. So that, that sense of connection to nature and to each other made my early starts and long days feel worthwhile. Now, our family watched MasterChef every night with meals in our laps, and my wife and daughter encouraged me to enter. They knew my love of food more than I did myself. So the year before, their words had fallen on my glass half-empty ears, but this time I thought, well, I suppose it can't hurt. So after hours of writing, my application form got lost when I went to submit it. The website crashed. And that was a really pivotal moment, because rather than giving up, I started again from scratch. A month later, I got an email back to say I had an audition four weeks' time, and it was time to grab life by the horns. I wanted to know if I had it in me. My teenage daughter believed I did, and she made me these cookies that says, Go Aaron, you will win MasterChef. I made a very strong choice at that point to let go of anything that could hold me back, so no more coffee, beer, and junk food, and I parked myself loathing while I was at it. So my recipe for success was mainly about bringing out my natural energy. No coffee, because I knew I was really strongly affected by it, highs and lows, and I didn't want to feel dependent on something that might be out of reach. Healthy food and eating lightly, because I knew that both of those made me feel good. I'd certainly proven the opposite right by this time. And getting out in nature to exercise, because when I do, I can really feel the stress burning off. Yoga and meditation were no-brainers, literally, getting the brain out of the way. And then lots of practice and prep, so deboning a duck, learning how to make shoe pastry, and figuring out what on earth Binet's sauce was. And the final pillar of the plan was my persona, and that was really easy, just be me. No pretense to keep up under pressure, and I knew that realness was the quality I liked the most when I watched others. Plus, I had a secret weapon, my wife, and she was my biggest supporter and coach. She was outstanding. 
Now, a few days before the audition, I had a very special experience. I'd gone for a run and stopped to rest under some really tall trees. With the sound of the wind whistling through the branches above me, I cast my mind ahead to the final of the competition. And it was amazing. I felt this sense, almost like deja vu, wash over me. And all through my body, I had the feeling as if I'd already won. So I used this recipe of mine to make life in the MasterChef mansion work. And rather than sleep where all the other guys were staying up late, every night I'd drag my mattress into the disused gymnasium um, and sleep there. So without coffee, I could wake up rested at 5 a.m. and I'd turn the sauna on. Then I'd jump back to bed for half an hour of meditating to music. Then I'd um, have a hot sweat in the sauna and jump in the cold pool, grab a quick shower and a shave before the rush. And then by 7 a.m. I was you know, eating a healthy breakfast and ready for anything. Um, there's a lot of waiting on a TV show, and I put that time to good use. I got known for doing yoga in a quiet corner, and that helped me to remain focused on what was in front of me, and it also helped me stay creative under the pressure of cameras and judges. When you're living in a $10 million party pad, I have to say it's tempting to get carried away and drink too much, but I knew for me that if I could get an early night and take it easy, I'd be much better off. So. I spent three months away from my family in that unique but bizarre bubble. And as much as I missed them, I felt a guilty relief to be away from the pressures of everyday life. I just had really utterly different ones in their place, like what on earth were they going to dream up for us today, and is everything we say in the house being recorded? So as the weeks rolled on, I dug deep to give 100% to the challenge. And to my surprise, I found I did really well. And at that point, my ego started to emerge from the hidden depths. And I began to draw conclusions about my life based on the very unreal situation of reality TV. I was thinking, if I was depressed before, doing really well now, maybe life at home is part of the problem. Below the surface, I was questioning my marriage. Something didn't feel right between us, and deep down I was blaming my wife. We talked on the phone almost every day, but I began to hold back what was really going on in my hidden world. I was closing myself off from her. And as contestants, we got interviewed at least twice a day, but I found myself covering up what was really going on for me. I'd opened a Pandora's box of very personal issues, and there was no way I wanted that on TV. The pressure kept on building, and my exercise kept on building as well. I started doing epic swimming missions in the day in the bay bound below the house, and um, I did tons of yoga, and I spent hours working on my ideas about food. And it worked. I won, and that was amazing. But that's also when the trouble really started for me. When I got home, I was on a high you know, at the start. I mean, winning the show, I have to say, was one of the most incredible things that had ever happened to me. But I was hiding a secret, and I dreaded the thought of it coming out in public, or worse, my wife hearing it from me. My timing was absolutely terrible, but I confessed to her that I betrayed her trust by nurturing a connection to someone else. Naturally, she was very upset, but she said, I know you love me and I forgive you. It wasn't so simple, though, because I couldn't forgive myself, and my self-criticism ate me up. My head was spinning when I got home, and I was trying to make sense of what I'd uncovered on the show, but I couldn't make sense of it, and that really affected our relationship. What could be a very special time in our lives often started to feel very different. We had to keep my win secret for seven months until it screened on TV, and I can tell you, with half of Raglan coming to our house every day to do yoga, that was really tricky. I, I loved having those special people in our lives, but also I felt very disconnected because it felt impossible to be honest with them, not just about the win, but about the difficult situation our family was going through. And it got pretty bizarre sometimes, like we could be in our kitchen in a horrible state in the morning, but then we'd put on a brave face for a magazine photo shoot and then crumble again when the reporter and photographer left. And intense is really the only word for that year. Um, the wind screened on TV, we collected the brand new car, and then I had a cookbook to write, so lots of recipes to create. Not to mention presenting at food shows and also a month as a guest chef at a fancy restaurant in Auckland. But underneath it all, I felt an appalling disconnect between how I saw myself and how the public saw me. So on the outside, I was the very public winner. People would come up to me in supermarkets and ask my opinion, you know, can I swap silver beet for kale in this recipe I'm doing? But on the inside, 
But on the inside, I felt like a fraud, and I felt full of secrecy and self-loathing. At times, the stress got so bad that it was all I could do was just curl up in bed, and basically, I, mean, I was having a nervous breakdown, but I was desperate not to let on. By the time my book was launched, I was severely burnt out, and I felt this huge expectation and obligation not just to live up to the public view of me, but also, you know, there was all these opportunities opening up. But like a slow motion train wreck, it all came piling on top of me, and I was in a real mess. I was grey and hollow and shattered. So deep down, I knew I had to face myself head on. And this wasn't to beat myself up, but to actually just come to terms with what I really felt inside. So I asked myself the really big questions. Am I engaged and satisfied in my marriage? And if not, why not? And apart from breaking the trust between us, how else have I contributed to anything that's not working between us? And am I making the world a better place and living a life I'll be proud to look back on? And if not, what am I going to do about it? So I found the courage to start sharing what was really going on for me. And that was incredibly hard at the start, but the more I did, the easier it got. And I have to say, it made a massive difference to how I felt. And the first time I said no was an absolute game changer for me. I was all booked in to do an unpaid TV appearance, but with a few days to go, they'd called to say they needed to change the dates. Now, this was going to clash with a family trip we'd made with our daughter's exchange student, and I felt this sense of obligation just smothering me. I just felt completely buried by it. Have you ever had a situation, you know, where someone's telling you all the f reasons you should do something, but somewhere deep inside, you just know you have to stand firm? I did, and that was a totally unfamiliar feeling to me. But that afternoon, I felt like a new human being. The whole world just opened up around me. And hardest of all was I dug deep and found the nerve to ask for help. I personally had to make life incredibly hard for myself first, but that's what it took. So a couple of counsellors I saw each helped in different ways. One of them told me about the concept of ruminating, where our thoughts are like a, a stuck record and we just keep on retracing past mistakes. So now that I get that idea, I can actually catch myself doing it and break the flow. And I also went to see a psychologist, and I can tell you that wasn't on my bucket list. So after sitting in the chair and bearing my soul, I braced myself. How bad was it? So he drew a graph and said, well, if you're here, you'd probably have a clinical issue, but you're really just about here. What a relief. I was only half nuts. <laughs> but Seriously, though, thinking I had a big problem was actually a part of my problem. So accepting I couldn't do it all on my own was vital for me. I used to think it was strong to be totally self-reliant. No. I think as Kiwis, we've got our number eight wires cost on that one. I'm not surprised we have such a high teen and rural suicide rate. We keep way too much locked inside. And I personally know five people who've taken their own lives. And just think, how many do you know? So looking forward, how do I see life now? Well, I'm actually in love with it again, but in a whole new way. I'm really super excited about nutrient-rich food and learning how things like stress can affect the way it works for my body and for my mind. Because I think food affects mood and mood affects food. You know how tired you feel if you stuff yourself? I sure do, but I know I far prefer waking up clear-headed and hungry the next morning after a good sleep. And with that clear head, and having that good sleep, my stress levels get lower, and I actually find it easier to make the choices that help me to feel good. Because digesting too much food is actually really demanding in our bodies, so I ask myself, am I going to wear my body down and possibly create the conditions for disease, or am I going to look after myself and feel more and more alive? And I'll tell you what, I reckon nothing tastes as good as aliveness feels. And I'm finding that feeling alive is actually all about feeling. I used to be so afraid of feeling bad that I found ways to feel very little. I'd have coffee for that rush of adrenaline, I'd eat sugary junk food to cover up what was inside, and then alcohol, of course, to numb the pains of my soul. So no wonder I love rum and coke, it's the terrible trio, alcohol, sugar and caffeine, all at once, you know, all on stage together. <laughs> but I've let those things go now, and I actually found it surprisingly easy because I ripped them out by the roots and plucked them out by the roots rather than just, you know, hacking away at the overgrowth all the time. So my journey so far 
feels like an endurance event. It's been really tough at times, but some really great lessons as well. And the first lesson for me was to take responsibility for my own well-being. So it was a real risk to start making bread, but I took a stand to make my work more satisfying. And then on MasterChef, I created that plan and did everything I possibly could to make it work. And then when I crashed, I had to look deep inside and own what I really felt. And I find that with great responsibility comes great power. So if I avoid the spotlight and blame others, I cut myself off from them, but in the process I cut off my own power and aliveness. And this one's really big for me. People don't fall out of love, they just stop sharing. I'd closed key parts of myself off from my wife years ago, but then blamed her when I felt that we weren't connecting. So our obsession with how people see us doesn't do us any favours. I know for me, being so worried about how people would see me after I won MasterChef added hugely to my stress. And I realise I can't do it all on my own. Other people are our greatest resource in life, and it's a sign of real strength to admit that we need a hand and to ask for help. So what I've learned helped me, but that's not why I'm here. If anything I've said rang a bell for you, I have a challenge. Be brave, share what's really going on, and learn to say no when things are too much. And ask for help. Asking for help is a really big one. As long as we have a pulse, there's hope that fog can lift. And if you know someone that isn't looking too happy with life, get in there and show you care. Spend time with them and listen. Don't just talk, but listen to how it is for them. Ask how they really are. I'm fine, there's no place in the world I want to live in. Don't just accept it and carry on, assuming the problem will go away. Do whatever it takes to connect with the people you care about. You deserve to feel alive, and they deserve the best of you. I think you can see for me, it's a better me than at the start. So not showing who we really are can tear us apart. I've shown you the real me, and now it's your turn. Get out there and show the world the real you.